Hello, everybody. Here we are again. Welcome to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. My name is Colin Way. Um, today, we're going to look at hollow forms and um, we're going to use the Pro Form um, from Woodcut. And um, one of my favorite hollowing tools, actually, but not just, you know, what we're about here. We're not just looking at the tool, we're looking about the whole process. So, this is really a project led um, demonstration, but using the Pro Form. There's a few other bits and bobs as well. Like all of our demonstrations, we really, really encourage questions. So if you've got any problems, for instance, with the particular tool, or you've got some thoughts on them, just ask. We've got Ben asking questions today. I've got Jason on the cameras. So, you know, we've got a good crew there. So just fire those questions away and we'll, we'll do our very best. And likewise, if we don't know, we'll find out for you. So just keep piling those questions in. Um, the pro form, if you don't know what the, the, um, the Woodcut pro form is, there it is. My cameras are over here, by the way, so I'm not ignoring you. I'm looking at a TV screen to get the exact angles. But that's a pro form or pro master. Um, uh, this is one of my own here, um, and it's nicely sharp. And one issue that you sometimes get with um, using these, if you get them fiber up on dry timber especially, is because it's not sharp enough. It's quite easy. You've got to really make these razor sharp and not too big a cut as well. They will clog up if you if you have a big cut that you're trying to push through dry fibrous timber. But we're going to look at using it in a minute. Not yet, though. We've got a lump of timber on here. I've been wittering on about this particular ash tree that I've been taking down now for some months now because it's, it's very big and there's only me and my, uh, my two boys. So we've been getting lumps to do different projects. If you remember before Christmas, we've done some... Um, some bowl coring, um, and here we're going to do some hollow forms. What I want to end up with is a hollow form grass pot, so this sort of shape grass pot. Um, it's not my shape. I'm going to completely front up with you now. I'm very lucky. I get some professional training from time to time, and I pick the people that I like or the work that I like, and in this case, I went and spent a couple of days with Phil Irons, and if you want to look him up, philionswoodturning.co.uk. He's probably one of the better known and better um, uh, hollow form uh, makers in the UK at the moment. But look him up. It's philionswoodturning.co.uk. And uh, he's got courses on offer, all those sorts of things. So um, one of the slides I'm going to show you later on is a pot that I made at his place. And that was the reason that I'm just going to show you that is what do you do with the inside of a pot? And it is entirely up to you. The choices that you have and really determined by what the pot's going to be used for. In our project today, I'm going to shape the outside. We're going to start looking at hollowing the inside. Then we're going to swap around with some that I've got to different stages. One of those is this one. So this is a little tiny um, dried grass vase. We're going to keep weight in the bottom of it purely because I want that to stand up under its own weight with dry grasses out of the top. But inside, you can't really see. It's a small opening in the top there. And that I'm going to paint black. Okay, I don't, I'm going to sand it very roughly where I can get to, but then paint it black because you don't need to see inside. It's a vase, for, for instance. If you're making something that's to be shown, so this one here, you might think differently. You might think, okay, well, we've got a nice surface on the outside. I want to do something in the inside so I wouldn't paint that black, for instance. Okay, and there's all sorts of choices then. Do you color and, and um, keep natural and all those things? So we'll start off with a question from Ben, or not from Ben, through Ben. Okay, so Colin, we've got a, a question from Glyn. Um, he has a 300 millimeter by 180 millimeter round piece of walnut, uh, so disc of trunk, yeah. um, which is punky on about a third of the circular and about 75 mil deep. Um, it can't seem to run it balanced. Is it because the, the punky bit is lighter? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's what it would be. So you think about once it's gone rotten, um, and really spongy has lost a lot of that density. So it will literally be like a solid lump of timber on one side and uh, a void on the other side. So that's why you're getting that unevenness. Um, not a lot you can do about it. I mean, once you, you know, once dry, you could um, harden up that soft area with several things, depending on the size of it. Certainly, sanding sealer is a good one to soak it in sanding sealer and let it fully dry. Small areas you can get away with thin super glue. Um, those sorts of things, but when wet, it's a difficult one. Really, you've got to you've got to really sort of um, just keep that lay speed down and and uh, and get some of the mask on before you you know before you start the, the speed up a little bit. But no, that is exactly what it is. Okay, right. So we will start off. Um, there's quite a lot to do today, so 
that's why I've sort of started with several bits already done. This is um, the riffled ash. We've got some lovely riffles going through it. You can just see them there. Okay, really, really nice bit of rippled ash. But as we get around, you'll see those more. This is going to be the bottom. I'm going to make a foot to hold in what we refer to as the H jaws. The H jaws are on the Axminster SK114. And these are basically, they're a set of jaws with serrations um, on the inside and outside. But they're also really quite deep. Really good for this sort of thing. If I show you one that we've pre prepared earlier. Oh, there we are. So that's the grip that I've got for my H jaw. So you can see the depth of that one. This is going to be one of the pots that we clean up at the end, actually. Um, so you'll see how we do that. But yeah, that H jaw is nice and deep and tend to be most of the hollow forms um, are done with either the H or what we call the G's, which are the next size up again. OK, so let's start turning. Um, we're going to rough down to a cylinder, create the foot for the H jaws, then get the, the chuck involved. So lay speed to zero first. OK. We're going to start at zero, slowly speed that lathe up. You're going to feel a little bit seasick just to begin with. That won't last for long. Um, I'm running there at 500 revs, and I'm going to start off with a half-inch gouge, so a big 12 mil bowl gouge. Um, uh, to me, I don't like using roughing gouges on this sort of size work. It's just a little bit too aggressive, really. Bowl gouge, as long as you're cutting the side grain. So I'm cutting here, going toward the center of the piece, rather than cutting along the length, because that way I'll cut the, um, the side grain, not the end grain. This is where we cover Ben and Jason in shavings. So, in an ideal world, in an ideal world here, I want this about double the speed. It's too big and bulky. Um, I don't want to have any problems, so I'm just going to keep it that speed for the moment. But not for long. Incidentally, one bit of information I haven't given you, the sensors that we're using here is, are the pro drives. I've got a 25 mil an inch pro drive in the headstock, the drive end. And then the tail stock, we've got the little 16 mil. Just, it's just really the small one, so it doesn't get in the way of me forming a foot for the chuck. Yes, Ben. Um, so <clears throat> we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Vicky. Um, are you going to be turning platters anytime soon? Are platters on the agenda? Platters are on the agenda. I've filled out the next couple of months, and platters are one of the demos we do. Yes. And then one here from Warren. Um, he says he's doing a similar project and trying to remove some of the the inner uh, with both gouges and drill bits on the lathe. Um, all he's getting is dust. Um, all tools are freshly sharp, and it's spotted beach. And it's spotted beached. Um, the way, there's several reasons. Um, so with drill bits, with bowl um, gouges yeah, and drill so he's bits. he's tried with both gouges and drill bits on the lathe, and he's just getting dust and full of a shade. Yeah, I mean, it depends. On, I'd like to see the spotted beach, really, but some spotted beach can be quite dead. Um, so completely void of any moisture whatsoever. So you're almost talking dust at that point. Probably what it is, it's probably so dry that, uh, you know, that's your issue. I don't think, and if your chisels are sharp and, and don't get the, don't um, get me wrong here and the lay's running in the right, right way. And then what, the reason I say that is sometimes, you know, if you hit reverse and you're drilling that you will get dust, but it doesn't sound like that's happening at all. It's probably just dry and punky. That's all. Um, I don't think it sounds like anything you've done. And then a question from Terry. Um, it's an airbrush question. Uh, trouble with acrylic gloss not coming out uniformly. Um, acrylic, it might be that it's drying too quickly. Acrylic needs to be used very quickly. Well, if you, once you put it in the airbrush, you need to be getting on and using it. Um, otherwise, you might just have the, um, it might just be a little bit too thick. So try the vis viscosity test. Go online, search viscosity test for airbrushing, and you'll see it. Be a drip test. And you can work out nozzle size to um, the viscosity of the um, liquid that you're using, which, you, like I say, you work out on that uh, viscosity test. And then a question from Douglas. Um, how big is that blank, please? The blank is, is, let's measure. So we are looking 
So 160, so about uh, about six and a half inches by by eight inches uh, long, so 200 long. Right, let's just crack on. You got any more for the minute? Go on more. Go on then, far yeah. away. Um, so Chris, Christopher's asking, um, is there any wood that should not be used if it's going to be in contact with food? Yeah, yeah there's quite a few. There's quite a few, and it depends on what you're making. So if you're if you're using timbers that are designed to get wet, so kitchen utensils. We've been talking kitchen utensils this week because myself and Ben are doing a future couple of demos, um, making spoons and spatulas and things like that. So of it, the obvious ones are going to be things like laburnums and yews and all those sorts of things. Um, if you're making something like a fruit bowl, not quite so important because you're not talking wet food. Salad bowl again, you've got to be careful. Um, I've done some uh, you um, salt and pepper grinders before because you know it's it's a dry substance. You're not actually coming into contact or making it wet. So you have to think about what you're doing uh, or what it's going to be for um, before you say yay or nay to the timbers. And there's also um, uh, something else that me and Ben have been talking about before um, we went live was. Um, allergies to certain timbers and i i know that um, there's a lot of people very allergic to you some people are allergic to cedars um and things like that so not just the, the sort of the poison side of it but it's the uh, you know allergies as well so it's things to consider like that wet foods then you know go on all the inert timbers things like um, beaches and sycamores and and maples that sort of stuff if you're tall unsure don't use it Right, so that's the worst bit. So that's quite an aggressive cut that we're doing there. What we can do now is calm things down a little bit. What I don't like watching, certainly as a demonstrator, I don't like watching a demonstration that involves just one person doing one, um, one cut for the whole session. So that's why I've got lots of pots at different stages. Now, though, we can start taking that down, turning the speed up a little bit, double checking. And if you notice, I'm checking that a lot, checking to make sure everything's nice and firm in the lay still, making sure there's no slop has happened, everything's nice and tight. So I'm safe. And again, if I'm in my own workshop when I'm not talking to people, I wouldn't be in just in goggles. I'd be in my whole face visor and everything. So Bear that in mind. Don't take it from me just because I'm wearing goggles now. That's what you should do. i got nice pretty bits like teeth and nose and chin that want to be protected, especially when you couple that with ability. So if you're just starting out in this trade, hobby, craft, think about your ability as well, all right? The likelihood of an accident gets higher with the less practice that you have. So we're just getting down the round. So we're round now. So let's make our foot. So we're going to go with the H jaws. Remember, I've already set my calipers. So I've got the the calipers all set there. Yes, Ben. Okay, so a question from Derek. Um, he's just asking what Hawthorne's like for wood turning. He's just starting out. Hawthorne's really, really nice. It's a very dense timber, quite pale.
Yeah, Hawthorne's really nice. It's, it's dense timber. It's pale. It's used sometimes for mallet heads, that sort of thing. Um, really quite a nice material to use. Let's have another check. Yes, Ben. Okay, so a question from... Um Woodwork Learner. Um, so he's asking when your skew's going to be back in stock. Well, I think Lily's on that. Um, would the smaller one be better for smaller lathes? The, the Colwyn Way skew. Um, so the smaller projects um, as opposed to lathes. Because I'm using that small one on my 406 an awful lot. Um, it depends on what, what size projects you're making. So if you're thinking... Um, uh, staircase spin uh, no not staircase spindles if you're thinking your posts sort of three four inch diameter things then the big one brilliant um if you're thinking more crafty things like pens and um light pools bottle stoppers that sort of stuff then then the small ones needed uh, and jewelry and things like that um and then obviously the middle size for the middle size project so it's, it's gauge it on size of projects that you tend to do if you're an all-rounder then you know you might need a couple of sizes, but uh, but yeah, that that's how I sort of differentiate the the two. Yeah. Um. So it's one I can answer here from Brian, and um, just after if Jason's going to be doing any of his box turning, um, and I think that's definitely on the cards. Um, that the uh, we've got that one planned in. So so watch your space. Ne um. Next week, isn't it? Tuesday. Next week, Tuesday for for Jason's boxes. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Um, and then we've got one here. Sorry, let me just scroll down. Um, what grind do you use on your bowl gouges? Do you know it? Um, I'm got a Tormek, I know, a Tormek uh, jig. So I'm using their um, profile number four, which gives a 55 degree bevel angle. Okay, and I, I do sweep those um, those wings back quite a long way as well. So the uh, Tormex setting number four, um, and go online if you don't know what that is. Go online; it gives you the uh, gives you that information. You just put Tormex jig settings, and you'll see it there. And Jean's just asking, um, who is your turning idol? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one. I have loads. I have loads, and I'm not going to start mentioning them now because I might leave somebody out. Um, but the, yeah, there's loads. <sighs> I'm not going to mention anybody. Um, look all of these guys up on um, YouTube, on Insta and things like that. So you look at people um, like I've already mentioned Phil. Um, and I take a little bit from all of these guys, really, in terms of... Um, inspiration so this is hollow forms i might look at nick agar for his his design and decoration um there'd be people like um oh there's so many now i'm gonna forget them. um uh, gary rance for his speed steve the wood turner on instagram is just lightning when it comes to using skews dave dolby for skews richard finley for skews um and anything production based richard kennedy stuart mortimer burt marsh john jordan um uh carl and Lindsay, les thorn ray key i mean there's there's loads there's loads and loads and loads um and take a bit from each of them right so back between centers yes ben um so a question from harvey um why would you use serrated jaws over a dovetail um because they're bigger bigger and um most of the the dovetail jaws that i have um are quite small sorry ben so all i'm doing at the moment is roughing remember the shape we're going for absolutely nothing um fine about this at all Let's just tied a few bits up 
to get the bevel rubbing. Right, now I'm just going to take a little bit off the front. Remember what this is going to be. Being this short, I've got two options. So I've got a couple of options with a pot of this size. We can do something like like the, um, the old dried flower vase, so a little bit lumpier in the bottom. We can do some of the um, bigger options, same sort of thing. Um, or this sort of size, I quite like making and i've done a few demos on this the the leaning um leaning garlic pots basically again a bit of weight in the bottom and then sand when you finish sand a flat at an angle so they lean forward they're great for the kitchen for putting your your chilies your garlic all of that sort of thing in especially with the fact that you can keep the opening at the top quite big you know, and if we're starting out having a, a big opening at the top using the hollow form tools will help you so much. So just tidy up a little bit. So, and I think this will probably lend itself more to a garlic pot than a vase because of its size because of its dimensions. Now, and I don't worry too much about the bottom at this stage because once this has been hollowed out, we're going to leave it um, purposely thick because this is then going to have to be set aside and dried for a while, usually around about on this sort of pot, probably about five to six months. Yes, Ben. Um, so JPN says he's thinking about buying the intermediate set of woodcut pro form tools. Um, do they work as well on dry timber end grain hollowing? Uh, dry timber, yes. No, the, 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 there is no denying. I prefer them on wet timber. But yes, as long as you keep them really, really sharp, they will work on dry timber. Um, but like any turning tool you know if that timber is very fibrous it causes a few more issues because the, the the shavings come off more stringy so they can bind up on the bevel and that's no different on the the you know the the pro form as it would be on a bowl gouge so you know keep the razor sharp um and pick your timbers well yes ben okay and a question for norbert um are the chucks and jaws like the 114 available through a usa vendor yeah, they are. Um, if you go through um, uh, woodturningstore.com um, in New York, um, they're doing mail order uh, throughout the US, and uh, you'll be able to get all the accidents to Chuck centers um, and jewels from them. So it's woodturningstore.com. And then Douglas is asking um, if you had a 10 inch square of you, how would you turn a hollow form like your grass pot? Depending on the grain orientation, really. Um, Because what we've got here, we're on a, what I'm turning at the moment is the end grain, but I'm turning side on to the end grain so it's nice and soft. So if you've got a 10 inch square, why don't you make, why don't you make four, four five inch square um, pots for that sort of size? I mean, that's no bigger. That's probably about four inch, that one. Um, so, you know, you think getting four five inch pots would work. Right, I need to put the tool rest on now sorry the tail stock on now we're just going to drill a hole in that because these tools don't like using or don't put, don't like cutting the very center nib so we're going to drill out the center lathe speed's going to creep down because i don't want to be drilling at a thousand revs that's far too quick and we get horrible noises screeches steam all that sort of stuff yes ben 
Okay, so a question from Pete. Um, is there a way to waterproof a turned vase so you can use it for flowers in water? Um, to do that, you'd have to completely seal it. So I would go with something like an epoxy resin. That would be the best thing. And then maybe a countertop epoxy resin. So you'd do a sealing coat first and then um, probably two other coats of, of countertop resin to, to make it waterproof. You'd have to check the manufacturer's guidelines on that to confirm um, but that would be the only way I know. Um, Joe Laird is a fantastic Irish wood turner, a good friend of mine. He makes uh, whiskey tankards, but he does them in the old way of, of whiskey barrel, um, the same way they make whiskey barrels, where you've got end grain in the bottom as well, and then he's heated. It physically burns the stuff. I don't know what the process is, but go on his website, Joe Laird Wood Turning, and you'll see that process um, as well. So that you won't do that with a drinking vessel unless you're doing um, sort of wine or tankards. I know that, but it, you know, it's worth a look that. So let's go with the drill chuck and a nice long beam drill. Yes, Ben, keep, keep, um, keep on flying. So sorry. Wood, woodwork learners asking um, what's the difference between the pro form tools and the carbide tip tools. So, um, well, the pro form is carbide, but it's a cutter. It's not a scraper. And so what you've got, uh, where is it? Let me, there, let me just show this camera. Um, this camera right here. Number one, or number three. Lovely. Let me do that there. So what it is, this is a cutter. So what we have um, is the carbide bit down here. This is nice and sharp, and you have the bevel on the top. So unlike conventional tools, we've got the bevel on the other side. The bevel is the um, sort of limiter almost, and it's the gap that you have between the carbide cutter and the bevel that generates the, the width of shaving. So it's a cutting tool as opposed to a scraping tool. And then Christopher's just got a suggestion. Um, he's saying, uh, good afternoon. Could you do a skew video with your signature skew? Um, he loves the tool, but it has a devil of a time turning beads with it. Um, well, do you know... We haven't mentioned the Colwyn Way skew for a long time, so that might be worth a shout. Actually, um, I haven't. Uh, no, I haven't got it on the list at the moment. But absolutely, yes, we will. Um, every opportunity I can get to use it, we do. Um, yes, no, absolutely, that's something we can we can most definitely do. In the meantime, look at people. If you're on Instagram, look at people like Steve the Wood Turner. Dave Dolby, Richard Finley, they are constantly, every single week, putting out um, videos of rolling beads. Very, very interesting, very uh, inspirational. Um, and you pick so much up. Far better, far better than I could ever hope to be with the skewed chisel. Um, their production turners, they do it day in, day out. The only weird thing I would say with the skew, and I know we're hollow forming here, is when you're starting to, if you're struggling to use a skew, use the heel point as opposed to the main cutting edge. When you get really good with the skew and rolling beads, then you can use the, the bottom half to roll a bead as well as plain. But to start with, just use the heel point, and that will get you started in bead forming and bead rolling. Right, I'm at 650 revs there. I'm going to start drilling. Don't matter if the if the drill bit starts wobbling around. doesn't make any difference to me. And this has got to go in quite a long way. If it starts screeching, we'll use some wax. Make sure you keep the swarf clear, though. We don't want anything binding up there, because if we do, we'll probably get the drill bit stuck. So keep retrieving that drill bit out regularly. All right. By the time you've got to that stage, don't touch the end of the drill bit with your finger to clear the swarf because you'll um, you'll hurt yourself. It'll be really, really hot. There we are. That's about the, the end of my quill travel there. So we're going to just pop the whole of that tailstock up, take off those shavings. So remember, this is a piece of wet timber. It'll need to be dried. Um, and I do a lot of these. As soon as the timber comes in, I'll get them rough turned. Horrible screech. Um, I'll get them rough turned and leave them dry, drying for about five to six months. There we are. I'm going to stop there. 
just because you don't want because you don't want to see me drill for too long. Probably about an inch shy. We can get that out of the way. We can get our tailstock out of the way again. And now what I'm going to do, and this is something, this is, this is a top tip, I guess. Um, instead of leaving the headstock where it is and lean over the bed, if you've got the luxury of having space and you have the luxury of having something with a moving headstock, move that up so it faces you, so you're not leaning over. Because it only has to be probably a matter of an hour of you with your back slightly bent before it starts aching. So just so I can keep in touch with the cameras, I've got a little mark on my bed here that I can bring the headstock up to. And that should still be, yeah, look at that. For the end camera so we can see in just in the right spot now two options here i'm going to start off using the tool rest but then i want to look at something another woodcut product we're going to then go to this one remember phil irons that i was talking to you about this is the irons um tool gate and this is an idea of his that you came up with it fixes your um uh, the the hollowing tool in position is really really useful for levering especially but i want to show you both because you're not i wouldn't have thought you're all gonna have one of those just yet now two things here um well one thing really there's the carbide edge and you can see there's a lip here you've got to make sure that the actual steel of that bar is on a tool rest okay so i can't get right up to it at this stage otherwise our I'll be on the cutter and not the main support. One other thing, there is nothing stopping you. Um, at the moment, we have just this, the actual tool still here. There's nothing stopping you from putting the whole of that bar back into the handle and actually using the handle um, on the tool rest as support. So if you're doing, say, for instance, you're doubling up, um, go back to, yeah, that's well done, Jace. Say, for instance, you've got massive hollow form on it and that, leverage just isn't enough what you'll then do is another handle on the end like that so you can see the sort of sides we're getting to now bring this all the way into the handle and that's your support area so for big pieces you get massive amount of support not quite needed on something this size but it's there when needed stand up right there we go okay let's start a little bit of hollowing of course we need to be in touch. We need to have this close to us. If anything goes wrong, I want it this side, my side of the project. I didn't want to be reaching over um, the danger to get to the off switch. Yes, Ben. Um, so Ian's asking, have you ever tried to use a cent uh, engineering center drill to, um, to spot your drilling? Um, that will stop the drill from wobbling? I haven't. I'll be honest. I haven't. Good tip. Again, another top tip there, guys. And David's just asking, could you kiln dry the wood after it is formed to speed up the drying process? Yeah, absolutely. No problem there. If you have the luxury of a kiln to dry. There we are. So all I'm going to do, start pulling around. And I'm working from the center out. What that's doing is cutting side grain. Lovely shavings coming off that. So that's proper cuts. That's ribbons. If you're cutting with a bowl gouge down there, you're going to have two problems. The rim is going to be far too narrow to bring the, the bevel around to rub the bottom of the pot. Um, so you won't be very far into that pot before the bevel stops rubbing. 
also the leverage on you and a bowl gouge is quite extreme. The fact that we've got a bevel on top of this tool, it's almost like um uh, like a limiter, I suppose. Really, it, you know, it just stops stops too big a cut from happening. You set that to whatever you want. Ben, can you tell me if I get in the way? So you see what we're doing? We're just running back and forward. I'm just going to enlarge the hole in a minute just to just by using the front. So we'll come back again. Lovely, lovely ribbons. They're a real joy to use these tools. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to make you sit and watch the whole of this process. I have one that I've started doing before. It's all dry, so we're just going to finish the inside. So I'm literally, I can't see what's going on, so I'm using the tool by feel. Let's take out some of these shavings a minute. I'm just going to stop the lathe just to get rid of some of the shavings. Don't be tempted to put your fingers in there whilst it's going. So you can see where we got already. We're getting some good depth to there. What I'd like to do before we go too much further, and that we'll take a little bit more of a cut off there, but that's almost to the thickness. We'll leave it for rough turning. What I'll do now is, is get the thickness even. So... Let's keep those shavings coming. Am I there, Ben? Am I not in the way, all right? Very good. Am I good? So what I'm doing is just bringing the tool handle round a little bit further to my right. And we're slowly getting that, that nice, even wall thickness. It's quite important when you're, when you're rough turning to keep the wall thickness even, just so it dries evenly. It just helps keep everything in check, stops any splitting potentially from happening. There we are. Now, to check that wall thickness, you can go straight to your double-sided calipers. And I tend to use double-sided calipers very often when, when hollowing, whether it's um, for a finished piece or for these wet turn pieces. Keeping it even, as long as it's the same all the way up, you know the drawing is going to be nice and even as well. And then you just carry on. Like I say, you can if you, the deeper you go, the more handles you can – well, I say the more handles, you only want to put one more handle on – um, you could go, uh, you know, longer in handle, but that's it. That's that process. You do that until you get to that, and then you let it dry. Um, once you've let it dry, it will go slightly oval. We accept that because then we, because we've left it thick, we can then clean up the outside and the inside. And that's what I'm about to do with this one. So let's have a look. We can move that one. We're going to turn the laser speed down. I can remove that from my chuck. I'll finish that later. I'll finish that one later. Okay, but there, that's ready to finish. Let's just pop this one in. All I want to do with this one, just show you where we are in terms of what happens when it's when it's done, it's drying. This is now bone dry, like I say. So actually, it's not too bad at the moment. So we'll just skim the outside surface. Yes, Ben. Um, so
so hodgepodge is asking um is the proform tool is that um is it basically like a carbide version of a hook tool it, exactly what it is as origins are in hook tools yes they if you imagine a hook tool doesn't have a guard at all like you're saying this is all this is it's a, 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 a hook tool with a guard on it hook tool for beginners okay if you, you've never used a hook tool if you've never seen what a hook tool is um don't use it until you've had plenty of practice with something like this okay pat carroll if you um watching any of pat carroll's demonstrations just done a really good one um on a brick pot or made a brick effect pot and he hollowed the inside of that out with a hook tool if you can get to see that again brilliant um that will show you exactly what a hook tool is pat carroll another irish buddy okay nice sharp chisel i'm just going to skim the outside edge and take away now what i've done here i've dropped my um the, the handle from this side to the other side and i've raised the uh, tool rest a fraction because i want to drop my handle of the tool down okay and we're just going to skim i'm going to use the bottom of my bowl gouge like a skew chisel There we are. Can't get any further, so I'm going to bevel rub. Brilliant. Now, I'm not going to take anything away from this the base yet. I need to leave that base with loads of strength just while we finish hollowing. Tool rest is going to come away just to start with. Okay, and then back with our hollowing tool. What I'm going to do just to begin with is just skim that first outer edge here. I want to make that true and give me um, the thickness of material that I, I'm looking for, really. Yeah, Ben. Um, so a question from Steve. Uh, what's your opinion of the USA external laser guides that you can see on some websites? Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, if you're going to be doing a lot of it, you might think that will speed things up for you. Um, and, you know, just to help help you with your calipers. So I wouldn't have, I wouldn't not use calipers if you're going to use one of those. Basically, what they do, the laser guides we're talking about now. So they they match. Um, they match. Basically, they take on where the tip of your tool is. There'll be a little laser coming from above, um, and will point out exactly where the tip of your tool is, so you know how thick. Um, the surfaces of, of the, your hollow form. Um, yeah, if you're doing a lot of it, I would say probably. Um, I've never used them myself. I've seen them used, but... Just finding the cut. Again, we're not going really, really ultra thin. This particular pot needs weight in the bottom, so I'm going to keep it quite chunky on the bottom. You can just hear, as it's dried, where it's gone oval, I'm just taking that and making that true. I've got the top the right thickness now, or the thickness that I want, so what I'll do is take the tool rest up nice and close again. Keep getting a little bit more into that piece. And now we'll just finish the inside out.
right now. I'm going to come out and we're just going to empty the pot out. If you have, I'm lucky at home. I've got a um, an airline. You can put your airline in, squirt it out, and it'll shoot out for you. Um, I don't have that here. So you can either get an old Knickerbocker Glory spoon and scrape it out, or we take it off. Now, the only issue here is don't take it out the chuck. The minute you take it out the chuck, you recompress the timber, it's going to be off center again. So if you want to physically pour it out, you take the chuck off with the pot. Then you pour out. It just keeps coming. So with these little fibers especially because they sort of bind up on the inside if you've got something with a really small opening in it then you might decide you want to go for a scraping type hollower do you know i think that's fine we're not going to go any further i'm just going to clean the bottom up and then that's it yes ben um, so rob's asking could he see the phil irons um guide the guy, yeah, I didn't use that, did I? Well, well, I'll put the wet one back on in a minute. Remind me before we finish, we'll put the wet one on and we'll play with that. So let's get just the bottom. I want to do a little bit of a ridge in the bottom. So I'm just going to guide the tool down. Nice and gentle. There we are. I'll hit that ridge. And then just ease that little centre pit, elbow up and down a little bit, and then bring it back out. And that's nice and smooth. Just tilting the tool over as I bring it out so it doesn't accidentally catch. So now I've done that, I'm happy with the inside. Remember, I'm going to black this as well on the inside. Now I've done that, I'm going to shape the back end. So the, the actual hold point, at the moment... It's far too big. I want this nice and small, but don't forget it's, it has to be stable. It has to hold these dry flower vases. So th that's why there's that weight in the bottom. Let me just double check on thickness. It's nothing ultra thin. So there we are. I'm probably about 12 mil, about half an inch at the bottom for that weight. That's going to be a, a, probably twice the thickness of this one, which is well under quarter. Okay, bigger pot. So we'll leave that there. So let's shape our foot. Not too much off. I'm going to go with a little quarter inch bowl gouge. Or you could use a spindle gouge on this bit, I guess. I'm just going to pop a quick cut with a parting tool in so I know where this piece is ending before I start sanding. There we are. Just checking the, the overall form before we end. There we are. Okay. I'm going to quickly sand this. Ah, one thing I haven't done yet. I'm going to quickly sand it um, and get some sealer on before we then turn it over and take the bottom off here. Um, and then we'll have another look at that irons um, gate in a second. Yes, Ben. Um, so Ken's asking, um, do they, sorry, Proform, do, do they also have a circular cutter? Um, and why use the hook rather than the circular one? No, they don't. It's the the... The hook is the hook. There is no different one. Uh, let's go to... Sorry, I'm going to come into this camera here, Jace, and show... Well, there we are. So there you can see the hook bit. That is the only one that's uh, on the tool. 
the bevel is the brass colored section and that that shiny bit of the bevel is not something that's done through the wear on the the um uh, the timber that's i've done that i've burnished the top of that bevel in my head i figure if i've got a nice shiny surface as a bevel it's going to run through the timber a bit easier okay there you go one other thing whilst that view is really really good so let me just show you one other thing two seconds when it comes to sharpening these, I haven't had that question yet, how to sharpen. So let's just have a quick look. What I've made, I'm sharpening on the flat base. This is a nice, shiny, new uh, woodcut tool. And you can see that, that hook really neat. Okay. So to sharpen them, it's not an easy one to sharpen. If you want to do every now and again with a diamond file, brilliant. But what you don't want to do is flatten that beveled surface. That's very, very slightly concave. So I do it on the front face of my, excuse me for a minute, the front face of my Tormek on the flat platform. And made up, I'm just going to, uh, what am I doing? Um, made up a little holder for myself that rests on that flat base we're just with a bit of timber and an old grub screw there we are so there's the the cutter naked cutter off the tool and then bear with me. I've just made a little block of timber. Okay, that that fits into. And then that block of timber in turn just has got a little grub screw in it. Right, right way, Colin. That you can tighten up and locks on. And I've just self tapped that with that little, that little, uh, a little screw and that then fits on the flat face of the the grinder and i'm away okay it just gives me a little flat face it's a bit easier to work than just trying to hold with your fingers sort of thing right let's just the front face of that one i need the little quarter inch bowl gouge i'm just going to put a little detail on there should have done it earlier but There we are, it's just so it it sort of angles itself in a little bit. So dust extraction next. We're going to sand this up. Won't take me long. We're going to get some sealer on there, and then we're going to turn him over and do that to to the the um, the whole point. So dust extraction. Starting off with a hundred grit. Don't be afraid though. If you want to start coarser than that, you start coarser. The, um, the sanding police won't be around. So I'm going to bash through this nice and quick. So 100 grit, you can get the rotary sander in, you can get the power sander going if you want to. So after the 100 grit, I tend to just stop, have a check, see what things are looking like. Are there any tears? Are there any turning lines that need to disappear? Do I need to carry on with the full script? Stop, we'll have a look. So tears are, my, are what I'm hunting for, really. We look fairly good there. I have had a few questions, actually. Um, people struggling with sanding a little bit, always having those scratches left at the end. And that really is from your early stages of sanding. The way I tackle it is once I've used the really coarse grade, say the 100 and maybe even the 150, 
can then go to a hand rotary sander or a power sander with finer grades and that eliminates those early really deep scratches. There we are, a bit of a rotary sand now. So if I go with, let's go with a 240 grip while Ben asks the question. Yeah, Ben? Um, so it's going back to Ken's question um, about the, um, the, the round or ring tool. Have you used a carbide cutter that perhaps had a round um, head for hollowing? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, so we right going back to the early question. Yeah, the woodcut doesn't have that. But what is available um, are things like the um, evil uh, revolution um, from Crown. The difference between carbide solid cutters and hook type cutters are that you'll produce with the hook type, the ones I'm using, you produce shavings, so ribbon shavings. With the other type, you produce more more of a chip. I mean, on wet timber, you can produce shavings, but generally it's a chip. So if you're making hollow forms that have a very small opening, probably best to do that. Have the small chips that you can pour out like water. If you're using these tools that produce ribbons, you really need something with a slightly bigger neck or be prepared to go and hook it out, hook those shavings out with a tool, um, you know, like a, an old long spoon, that sort of thing. So that's the differences in use. Um, the shavings that they're going to produce will dictate the the pot, the vessel that you use them on. There we are. Yes, Ben. Sorry. And then um, Glyn's just saying he's he's just got himself a stay put hose. Yeah. Um, how does he get it to splay out like your one? And um, he said it doesn't want to. It, his doesn't want to seem to splay out. I won't do too much this then, but literally, it's it's a coil. It's a, like a um, it's a coil. So unwind it, starting from one end. And then just keep working it down and start the top again, keep working it down and so on. And slowly you'll get it to lay out. Dusting strike is going back on. Two forty grit on the rotary sander here. And this is going to eliminate all those deep scratches from the one hundred and the one fifty. There we are. So we'll have another check before we go over to. That's good. So we'll go over to the 400 grit. You know, ash is one of those timbers that really looks after the turner. Um, it does sand very, very well. It turns beautifully as well. So I'm not, I'm not trying to fool you here. It's not me. It's the timber really that's producing a, a, a nice, quick and easy finish. There, that's going to be enough for that. That to one side. I'll turn off the dust extractor. Um, Ben's got another question. Yes, mate. Um, so Hodgepodge is just asking, um, do we make any sort of sanding clamps or devices for sanding the inside of hollow forms? Um, uh, we don't make any, no. But there's, again, there's lots of ideas online. So I've seen things like um, squash balls, um, um, coated in Velcro so you can just use it as a hook to get in on a piece of um, dowel um, so you can use it as an extended arm to put Velcro back to brace if that's a good one. There are things out there uh, we used to do something and I can't remember what the name of it was but it was basically um, um, uh, you blew it up I can't remember what it was called um, and it had like finger abrasive on it as well, but that's not out there anymore. But yeah, make yourself something, a little squash ball, a little bit of dowel, um, a bit of Velcro on the end. And there you are. You've got a wand with the abrasive, Some, something like that. But I haven't seen them available in the, in the UK for a while, um, not to buy. Right, sanding cedar, I'm going to use cellulose and we're at 50, well here I'm at 
50 50 because this is really quite a thin solution i want it to soak in a long way um we don't have to use it diluted um terry from chestnut will definitely say don't use it diluted um my preference is to dilute it to cut through some of the natural oils in the timber to let it soak in a long way it carries you know the thinner the solution i just feel it carries deeper into the timber there we are that'll do us wipe off the surface what you don't want to do is let any finish any any liquid pool on the surface of your work because it'll it'll actually go sticky um this is designed to soak into the timber you see you know, those lovely ripples are starting to shine through now. What I'll do is just move the headstock back into shot so you can see what we're doing. There we are. You get those lovely ripples come through. I'll hold it up to the light in a minute when we when it's ready. Um, this will be, I tend to, with all the hollow forms, I do tend to lacquer them afterwards with a spray. Um, and you can do that with aerosol. You can do it. Let me just grab my aerosol down. This particular one here, if you're using, this is the chestnut version. Um, this particular one's satin, but they do a gloss version as well. Um, or you can use lacquers in um, air guns, of course. Now, just wait for that to just to dry a little bit. And because of the cellulose content, obviously, it, it, you know, it's going to dry a lot quicker than, than a, a water-based, an acrylic-type sealer. That's, that's why I use it, you know. So it's nearly dry. I'm just going to run a little bit of 600 grit at a very low speed over the top surface because that now risen the grain slightly. It's denibbed, or I'm denibbing. Now that grain is stood up. You know, obviously what we're doing here is different sizes of project, but they all work in the same way. We all do, you know, tackle them the same way, whether it's whether it's this one here, oh, whether it's the, the big birch one that we've got there. They're, they're done in exactly the same way. Yes, Ben? No? No? Sorry, I thought we had another question. Okay, so just going to a little bit deeper with the parting tool now. And then we'll cut that one off. I'm just going to go straight in with a pull saw in a minute. So I need to give myself space to do that. stop there we'll cut that one off so i'm not overthinking this i'm literally just going to use a pull saw cut it off and then we're going to hold between centers to to finish it there we are so really nice and quick so this is the area now we need to work on we need to think about a foot so for this, I'm just going to bring the center up, the tailstock center, hold it between centers to, to do it. So a little brattle mark on the underside. Obviously trying to be as accurate as I can be. There we are. Now this is ash. Ash is one of those timbers that will split very, very easily if you allow it. So what, what I don't want to do is put a single point in center in here and then take this down really, really small, only for it to come off the lathe. So I'm going to use a ring center on this. That will bind those fibers in together and it will stop it from, from splitting. So we need the tailstock back on. And I'm also just going to double check for... Um, that this tailstock and the headstock centers align so i've moved things around quite a bit so let's get the tailstock back on put my ring center in 
temporarily take the chuck off. Let's get rid of that tool rest just for five minutes. Temporarily take the chuck off. Um, and then just grab any one, any centre that you have handy. So let's go another another ring centre there. Look, we're just going to bring the head and tail stock up together, align our two points. Once they're lined up, centres can come back out again. Well, that one can come out. Chuck can go back on. And now again, this is a little cone. A cone that I made um, earlier this morning, but I've got a series of sizes of these at home. You can, I know in the US you can buy these as um, pre-made nylon cones. Um, I tended just to make them out of a bit of scrap wood. This is a bit of old elm, um, and it's just literally just a cone um, that fits into, in this case, my H jaws. You can use router matting over this now if you want to. However, just be aware that router matting is quite thick and we're going over a cone, it could throw the piece off. You can use a little bit of workshop tissue. Don't use um, patterned um, kitchen tissue because the dye comes off on your workpiece. So be, be aware of that. So if I double up the sheets, yes, Ben. Um, so a question from David, what's the stay put hose going into? Oh, the stay put hose. This is um, this is a uh, what do they call them? Des. We call them Des for short, um, but they're they're just the, we do two versions of these. They're a means to hold um, hose when you're on the lathe or, um, or or mouth dust extraction mouth on the lathe. That the other end of that then is connected to your hose that goes to your dust extractor. Okay, so it's just a a variable height hose holder. And then Ryan's asking, um, why did you need to realign the centers on your lathe? Because I've been swiveling that headstock around. Um, it aligns, but if you want a good enough to turn between centers, but for this sort of thing or for drilling, I want it absolutely bang on. And to have that that accurate means I would struggle to get that pin back in again after I um, rotated it back. So there's a little, always a little bit of give, so I can actually get the pin in easy. All right, let's go for a smaller tool rest. I, I'm still going to have to do a little bit of work on this. I won't be able to go down to nothing because I've got a tailstock centre in the way there. So I'm going to clean up as far as I can go, do a little bit of sanding, and then do the rest on my rotary sander. So that's held between centres, lay speed to zero. So it's a little bit of movement on the... on the actual drive. See what we're doing, just gently nudging away. There we are. I'm going to do a little bit of sanding. A little bit of sanding, and I'm not going to go to 100 grit. We're going to go to 150, 400. There we are, 400. That's done. There we are. So next stage on again. So now we just have this little nib on the underside to take off. Um, and we're going to do that with the rotary sander next. So I'm just going to swap jaws in here. In fact, I won't swap jaws. I'll swap chuck because we're still going to put that other piece back on in a minute and have a play with the iron's gate. So we'll pop that one on the on the wall. 
like my little pin jaws out. Nice small detailed jaws here. And let's go with a small disc. So this is, you know what these are. These are from the rotary sanders. I'm going to go quite coarse to start with. So let's go 120. And then we'll work our way back through. There we are, 120. Dust extractor is going to go on for this, though, because this will create a fair amount of dust. Don't forget, tail stock out of the way so you don't clash. And we're just going to take off that little nib. Go coarser, it's taking too long. You can see what I'm doing here. I'm just using the very corner just so I don't, I don't want to sort of misshape the base. So I'm going to now go back to that finer. And we'll end up with a with a 400. But just go with the 400 now, but that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Happy with that. So 400 grits. So there we are. You can see that we've taken away all those, all the signs of holding there. That's all ready for your name, for your brand, for the timber name, date, whatever you want to put on the bottom. We're going to paint the inside black, remember, and then we're going to spray the whole of the outside with a nice lacquer. It, the, the, what I found with these was certainly with ripple timbers. If the shinier you get it, the more those ripples will stand out. Okay, so we're going to answer some questions from Ben. Whilst I'm doing that, I'm just going to swap the lathe over so we can use the irons gate as well. Yes, Ben. Um, so we've got a question from Cliff. He said, why not saw off the nib and then sand it? That's what we've done. That's exactly what we've done. We just we just saw the nib off and then sand it away. You, I mean, you can. Um, you could carve some of it away if you're really careful. I do get a bit twitchy holding things like that, though, because they're quite slippery because they're, they're smooth. Um, and a sharp carving tool can be an issue sometimes. But, yeah, no, I, I, I literally parted down and um, sawed it off um, as close as I could get without risking the pot and then sanded it away. Um, I struggle with trying to put a flat base on using a disc sander because you'll never get it flat. It'll always be at a funny angle unless you're very lucky. So I always like to turn the base and then do that last little bit with the rotary sander. All right. And Simon's just asking very nicely if he could have a look at your, um, your DES, the um, just dust extraction sander. Well, as it was nicely, absolutely. 
Should I do that with the camera? Go on, then you do yeah, it with the okay. camera. While you're doing that, I'll setting up for this Iron's Gate. Whilst all this is happening, let me explain. Obviously, there's a lot going on this week in the workshops. We've got Ben tomorrow with um, spoons, um, carving and spoons. We've got Jason on Thursday. Are you sharpening garden tools on Thursday? Yeah, sharpening garden tools on Thursday. So that'd be a really interesting one. Certainly in the UK this time of year, we're starting to, to want to get out there a little bit more now. But next week, Jason Breach. Jason is has so far been doing all of the hand tool work. What he's going to be doing next week is going um, into his box making. You, most people, certainly they're into wood turning, will know Jason from his wood turning. Um, so he's in here next week. I think he's got two sessions next week as well. So, um, no, definitely look forward to that one. There we are. So I'm going to lock that up, lock that up. That one, right, there we are. So what I've done, so you've got the irons gate, which is this bit. This can be moved from one, po um, one post to another. So depending on what um, position you need to be in, I need to be there. At the moment, it's got a little split pin that just flips over. You need to decide what um, or know what your lathe tool post is because that's a separate purchase to this. You need to get the right one for your lathe. And then this um, little stop collar, we stop that or we set that so this is always cutting on centre. Um, and certainly that's what the instructions say. You may prefer, you might want it, certainly I do. I like to have this slightly higher. So the tool handle is slightly raised in my arm. Um, it works better for me that way. But you'd start off as the, the manufacturer says, and, and I have it on dead center. But that's where we are. And then this acts as a lever point, so I can leave around rather than it slide across the tool rest, you see. Let's get it in a bit closer because I'm cutting a good couple of inches down that pot already. See, I've taken that out of the chuck and I've put it back in. It's already wobbling around. So there we are. That's Let's keep it fairly conservative. Pop that in there. Look for the, the center. And I'm going to leave around. What it's doing for me is meaning that I'm not having to put quite as much pressure on the tool rest. Because that's already, the tool has been held in the, um, the little cup. So there. Any questions on that, guys, before? Oh, we've got a few more questions coming in. Keep firing the questions. Okay, so um, James is asking, the chuck that you just had on the lathe, was that the 114 with the reverse lock? The chuck, uh, the, so the chuck I've got on the lathe at the moment is a normal 114. The chuck before, no, I'll see if I can. No, two seconds. I will grab you one with the reverse lock. So, 114 with a reverse lock is this one here. Which camera are we? Well done, Jace. So, there we are. There's your grub screws in the back. Okay. And then Maurice is asking, um, what was the cone and how can he make one? The cone? So, the cone was just an old piece of elm. Um, and what I've done, now you can put this on a faceplate if you want to. Um, all I've done is made them um, uh, the right size to fit into my H jaws, which is the jaws I've been using for all of these hollow forms. Um, the H jaws, uh, you know, you can make them to suit any jaw, to be honest. But I just found that if I'm using this chuck to do to hold the bottoms of the bases, I may as well do use all the, uh, you know, the same size for it, all the other paraphernalia as well uh, just a, a cone bit of timber you can start off on a screw chuck if you want to create the foot there then hold that to do the 
the cone, if you wish. Um, and obviously, it's got to suit the hollow forms that you do. This one will suit that one, but it will also suit. Obviously, you've seen me just do the small one there, uh, da, 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 the small one there. But likewise, you know, it will even fit the big, big one that I haven't done yet. You know, and that's only a five inch cone, that one. So, it, you know, it's pretty versatile. Just make it suit what you're doing. All right, Ben. Right. Well, if there's no more questions, we got no more questions. We're all right. All right. Wow. That's a good, a good session there. So that was the woodcut pro mass or pro form. Um, my right hand when it comes to hollowing out that one. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that. If I haven't been able to answer your questions, just uh, email in to woodworkingwisdom.co.uk um, and, and ask the question, and they'll be answered usually within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, thank you very, very much. Don't forget tomorrow, um, drop in uh, and see Ben doing uh, or carving spoons and uh, spatulas. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye-bye.